Hello and welcome to Newsnight. This is a program where we speak to major league players in Nigeria's democracy and the issues generated from its drive for growth and development. I am Ladi Akiri Dunwale. It's our pleasure to have you join us. Security is the nation's topmost challenge today, many would say, with various manifestations of it right across the country. From the insurgency in the Northeast to banditry and kidnapping, herders versus farmers clashes over land use, armed robbery, amongst others, citizens may be forgiven for thinking that governments at the various levels are at a loss as to what to do. Not so, say the security agencies, particularly the armed forces who have been pressed into action. Our guest on the program today is Nigeria's Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Sadiq Abubakar. Marshal Abubakar, thank you so much for your time. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. This is a very busy time for the armed forces. Uh, most countries uh, which have very uh, powerful militaries, the Air Force is the, is the key element. Mm. Um, is that the case in Nigeria's own situation? Well, certainly uh, since the advent of the concept of air power, uh, the Air Force has actually played a very crucial role in resolving uh, security challenges, whether they are internally generated conflicts or they are conflicts between nations. So uh, I think it is the case in Nigeria. The Air Force has a very crucial role to play uh, in resolving some of the difficulties that uh, Nigeria is facing. Now, uh, you've been quite busy. Um, the insurgency with Boko Haram in the Northeast, mm -hmm. More recently in uh, Kaduna, Zamfara, and other places uh, in the Northwest and North Central um, regions. Let's start with the insurgency. Can you update us on what the situation is now? Well, obviously the situation uh, today is far better than what it was uh, some four years or five years back. Uh, Boko Haram has now been uh, more or less caged into a particular area, uh, mainly the lectured area where you have uh, settlements that are referred to as the tumbus. Uh, that is where you have the activity of uh, BHT, unlike what the situation was uh, in 2015, beginning or even in 2014, when we saw them uh, coming up to Abuja. They were in Yanya. Yanya was bombed twice. Madala, the UN headquarters was equally bombed, and uh, we also had an explosion in the uh, Banax Plaza area. So if you put the picture of where we are coming from and where we are today, I think it will be very, very safe to say that uh, Boko Haram has been substantially degraded. Uh, the war is not over yet. Um, like most insurgencies, you don't expect a situation where everything stops at once, even in most developed countries. But I can tell you for sure that so much has been achieved in the last four years with the support of the federal government, uh, equipping the armed forces, providing what we require, allowing us to have uh, additional manpower, and so on. I think uh, it is clear that the situation today is far better than what it was. Now, uh, let's come to what the, the logistics. You mentioned manpower. Uh, you're quoted sometime in February of uh, 2017 as saying that between 2016 and 2017, that year, mm -hmm. uh, the Air Force employed about 2,000 uh, personnel. Um, it's a rough figure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the exact figure is different, yeah. but that's the rough figure that was given. Um, has that helped in any way? Uh, to increase the capacity to respond to some of the challenges that w we talked about? Certainly, the manpower disposition of the service in 2015, uh, in my opinion, was grossly inadequate, uh, looking at the kind of challenges we are facing. And from 2015 to now, I think we have brought in about 7,500 recruits. And we have also enlisted 400 directional service commission officers, apart from the ones that are coming in from uh, Nigeria Defense Academy. So from 2015 to now, uh, we have made substantial progress in terms of uh, manpower disposition. And this is necessary because when we came in in 2015, 
our idea is to build on what is on ground in terms of moving the service to become more professional, uh, to become more disciplined, and to become more efficient and effective in employment of air power to deal with the security challenges that are facing uh, our nation. So for us to have a professional service, uh, you need to have the right structure. And that is why from 2015 to now, we have established two additional commands. You have the Special Operations Command, which is based in uh, Bauchi. You have the Ground Training Command, which is based in Inugu. And in addition to these two commands, there are quite a number of units that have been established. We have the Quick Response Group in uh, Ipetu Ijesha in Ocean State. You have another Quick Response Group in Zamfaras in Gusau. You have another one in Oweri. Uh, in addition to that, of course, we have the Quick Response Search and uh, the Quick Response Group in Kerang in Plateau State. Apart from the groups, you also have wings. You have the uh, quick response wing in Agatu. Agatu is one area that I'm sure you're familiar with. In, yes, in Benue. Yes, by in Benue State, where there were so many uh, issues of headsmen, farmers' clashes, and so on. We also have a quick response wing uh, in, uh, in Gembu, in Taraba State. Taraba State, too, is one area where we've had a lot of difficulties. And then, of course, we have also established a quick response wing in uh, Nasarawa State. The whole idea of having these uh, wings, quick response units, is to bring security closer to the Nigerian people and to also support other security agencies that are operating in these locations. And uh, members of these units are special forces uh, personnel who have been given adequate training and who are able to conduct some limited land operations. Uh, in support of the security agencies that are in these locations. So with this expansion, of course, you need to populate those units. You need to get people to be able to man these units, and that informed our decision to go into recruitment. In the past, we had, first we had to expand the, the infrastructure in the training school, the military training center. We used to have capacity to take about 500 recruits but we expanded that capacity to 2,500. At any time, for every six months now, we can train 2,500 recruits. We also provided accommodation for the instructors that will be there to train the recruits. And the whole idea is for us to, to have a professional service, like I said, but professionalism is, is about having the right structure, hence the establishment of all these units. And I think, Currently, in 2019, we have just released the uh, results for uh, recruitment of 2,000 Nigerians into the Air Force again. And uh, we, we also have about 201, we have 201 uh, Direction of Service Commission officers that are training currently. And these are officers, graduates that have passed out of our universities. And the idea is to get, uh, bridge the gap in terms of capacity in specific areas, like the medical field, you know, with all the hospitals we're establishing, uh, engineers, we're acquiring more platforms, and therefore you need to get in. What you are getting from Nigeria Defense Academy might not be adequate for the kind of expansion we are seeing. So I would say that, yes, in the last uh, four years or thereabout, we have expanded substantially and uh, both in terms of structure and in terms of manpower. Now, uh, while you were explaining the expansion, uh, you talked about those bases, the units, and so on. Mm -hmm. Apart from the personnel, the other thing that you would need uh, for all those bases is equipment as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know that not too long ago, uh, you took delivery of two new uh, high helicopters. Mm -hmm. um, there are other things you're supposed to have uh, also acquired, I mean, given the plan. Mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, for the Air Force and all of that. How is that going? What, what's the situation with that? I think uh, in that area too, uh, I must say that we are extremely grateful to the President and Commander-in-Chief for his understanding of the criticality of uh, air power in resolving some of these uh, difficulties we are facing in Nigeria. And I'll give you the statistics in terms of what has been acquired in the last four years or thereabout. You have the Super Mishak aircraft, which is um, a trainer aircraft, can also be equipped in some other roles. But primarily, uh, the Super Mishak aircraft is used for training. 
and the government acquired 10. That increased our capacity to conduct ab initial training by about 500%. Uh, apart from the Super Mishak, we also acquired the uh, MI-35M helicopters from the Russian Federation. These MI-35s are one of the, um, the helicopter is one of the most sophisticated helicopter gunships uh, in the world today. And we have deployed these helicopters. They are in the Northeast. They sometimes uh, we switch them over from Northeast to the Northwest where we see the need for that. We have acquired four of those. Now, right now we are expecting a fifth one in the month of June. Uh, so by the time the fifth one comes, you, you're talking of five. Unfortunately, we lost one in, in combat in Damasak while supporting uh, one of the army battalions there. But 10, 4, 1, you are talking of 15. Uh, we also have the Bell 412 helicopters, brand new that were released to the Air Force. So if you add that, you are talking of 17 brand new aircraft. Of course, uh, we have some other uh, platforms that were handed over to us from NMPC, the EC-135 helicopters, which are basically civil helicopters. But what we did was to conduct research and development and convert them into military use. We have guns now in the cabin, and the aircraft can withstand some of the difficulties and challenges that uh, ordinarily a civil aircraft will not be able to. So in terms of procurement, what is already in Nigeria, we are talking of about 18 brand new aircraft. 10 of those uh, 18 are meant for training, but training is very important. Unless you have pilots to fly, you have a means of bringing in pilots. Uh, you know, you'll not be able to fly the fighter aircraft or the helicopter gunships that you have. Well, uh, procurement of military equipment, whether it's aircraft or tanks or whatever, is not as easy as people are uh, expecting. Uh, sometimes I read in our Facebook, people talk of us, why are we not acquiring uh, more sophisticated platforms and so on. They forget that there are so many issues that are surrounding procurement of military equipment, even if you have the resources. Just like the typical case in the Super Tokan that you talked about, where we are going to pay, I mean, we have paid, and, but we are not going to acquire the Super Tokan probably until 2021. Uh, these uh, airplanes have to be uh, produced. There are so many companies that are involved in producing the different components. The owners of the aircraft will have to come and look at your facilities. Do you really have? Because everybody wants to guard uh, you know, their, their, their patent rights and make sure that everything is protected. So it's not as easy as people will want it to happen. We we'll love a situation where you just walk into a, a production center and say, look, give me three fighter aircraft and, and they roll it out. No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, first, uh, the country you are buying the equipment from has to accept to sell the equipment to you. And that is why for us, I think uh, we have laid the foundation. Actually, the foundation has been laid even before I came in by uh, late uh, Air Chief Marshal Badi, research and development. We must look inwards. We cannot continue to afford, uh, we cannot continue to expect uh, all that we require to deal with our challenges from outside. And the only way you can deal with that is to ensure that you pursue research and development, and that's exactly what we are doing. In the Air Force, we have partnership with 15 Nigerian universities, and we sometimes form cells made of people from the university and our own officers. We have trained quite a number of officers in uh, Cranfield University in the UK. We have over 15 PhD holders in aerospace engineering and, and other related uh, fields. So what is important uh, for me, I think we have started and we need to get the required linkage so that everybody will really be, um, all stakeholders will be involved in addressing some of our challenges with regards to maintenance of aircraft and even producing our own uh, fighter aircraft. Now, uh, when you mentioned that, the first thing that comes to mind is the Defense Industry Corporation, which was set up mm -hmm. with that objective in mind. Yeah. Uh, but it seems that down the years, um, that has not been the case. Uh, and it seems, <laughs> from what you said now, it would appear as if each service mm. would, would, uh, would now appear to have gone its own way 
to deal with its own issues since that objective was not, uh, uh, was not being achieved. Is that, is that a fair comment? Uh, not, not exactly so, because I, uh, about a year ago thereabouts, the defense headquarters, the chief of defense stab established, we uh, identified the need to have a, a DHQ outfit, a, a defense research and development bureau. And that was established, an act of the National Assembly was passed, and that bureau is kind of coordinating all activities of research and development within the armed forces of Nigeria. Uh, they are also partnering with other friendly nations to see how we can address some of the difficulties we are having with regards to uh, our equipment in the armed forces. But what I'm thinking is we, we should, as a matter of fact, go beyond that. What is happening now in uh, universities? There must be a way, and we have seen this uh, in the last few years, because there are highly talented and highly committed individuals in Nigerian universities. All that is required is for us to reach out to them, I, I, you know, come up with a national research and development strategy that will involve both the military, the tertiary institutions, the private sector, everybody. That is how nations move, and unless we do that, we'll continue to depend uh, substantially on other countries uh, to deal with some of the issues we have on ground. Now, before we, before we leave the Northeast, because I want to then take you to the Northwest and the more yes. current of the challenges, mm -hmm. uh, there was the incident uh, that took place in Rand, oh, yeah. for which there was an investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what is the result. Of course, I know that as the head of the Air Force, you had apologized to the people and uh, expressed the regret, but you also promised that uh, you were going to find out exactly how that transpired. Did you? Were you able to? Actually, the incident in Iran is one of the most tragic uh, things that have happened to the Nigerian Air Force. And every time I think about it, I feel sometimes emotional because uh, if you look at the circumstances, how the whole thing happened, uh, we have investigated, but because it's an operation that involves more than the Air Force, the Defense Headquarters actually set up a committee to go in there and find out what exactly happened. And um, the report, I believe DHU has made it uh, public. They have invited the press and they have shared their findings with them. But we must remember that uh, war, in war, there are tragic activities or tragic things sometimes happen. It's not always that you go out and succeed in killing the enemy that is killing innocent people. But sometimes, unfortunately, uh, you cannot totally eliminate collateral damage. In the case of Rand, it was not really collateral damage as such. Um, if you look at it, like I said, if you look at how the whole thing happened and how the pilots responded, they were, they were in the more, you know, out there eating and they were told this is what is happening, Boko Haram is out there to kill people and they immediately ran. But along the line, a number of issues happened, and a, a number of things. And I, like I said, the DHQ uh, has made public the report of what has happened. If it was purely an Air Force thing, we would have been the ones to, to, to make it public. But one thing that uh, we want to assure Nigerians is that uh, I believe that as a service, we are a professional service. We are highly trained officers. We've been to Armed Forces Command and Staff College, we've been to Defense College, we've been to War Colleges. So as a service, we have zero tolerance for human rights violation or for the killing of innocent people. Why are we fighting Boko Haram today? It's because Boko Haram is killing innocent people. That's why the Air Force, the Army, all the security agencies are fighting to stop that. So you cannot expect a service that is doing that to now go out on its own to start killing innocent people again. Sometimes things happen in war, tragic things. And what is important for us first is to find out why it happened. And find out that from all that we, we can uh, you know, uh, get from what really transpired, uh, nobody uh, uh, is, uh, what do I say it now? Everybody has played the kind of role that he's supposed to play. There was no negligence. There was no negligence on the part of any individual. If something, some mistakes happen and people, innocent people are killed. But like I said, in war, you cannot totally eliminate uh, collateral damage.
you can, especially where you are fighting insurgency, where people are, 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 are like the Northwest situation where you have both bandits and villagers, nobody, you can't really uh, distinguish who is a bandit and who is, unless when you use a lot of uh, intelligent gathering platforms like what we use in both the Northeast, more than 62% of all flights that we conducted in the last four years were targeted towards getting intelligence, ensuring that it is the right target we are hitting. Okay, so, but sometimes, like I said, in war, you cannot totally rule out the possibility of somebody innocent being killed. It's really unfortunate and tragic. Now, the, the, that was, the run incident was in January 2017. That's right. Uh, more recently, uh, in 2019, mm. uh, after we started the operations in Zamfara and Yeramikia. the Northwest, yes. um, the Air Force also got involved with that operation. Um, but then, again, this time, these were accusations yeah. uh, from the Council of Chiefs. Uh, I remember seeing one of your top uh, generals uh, yes. who you dispatched to mm -hmm. go and conduct an investigation yes. with a team. Have they reported back what they report back? Uh, they have not reported back. They, they have visited uh, quite a number of areas. They are still putting together their report. Um, I don't want to comment on that particular incident since a committee is working, but certainly there are certain fundamentals that are very easy to see from some of these accusations. When you say a village uh, was bombed by the Air Force, the first thing we want to ask is, bombed, did you say bombed, or, or was attacked, or what? And uh, for bombs, we don't use bombs in the Northwest operations at all. Because what kind of ammunition you use is by and large determined with the equipment disposition of the enemy. What kind of equipment is the enemy using? How brutal is the enemy? And so on and so forth. But for us in the Northwest, like I said, we don't, we don't use bombs at all. And I think our public relations department uh, came out to make that very clear. But uh, like I said, the service has zero tolerance for human rights violations or operating outside the laws of armed conflict. Uh, you recall that about three or four weeks ago, there was something online, social media, where some soldiers were seen flogging an unarmed bandit. And when we discovered that one of the uh, persons there was a uh, personnel of the Air Force, we arrested the commander of that place immediately. And we have started procedures to make sure that uh, we hold him accountable to what he's doing. We do not tolerate violation of human rights. And so I believe that at the end of the investigation, we'll have a clear picture of what really happened. But I want to tell you that from July last year to now, the Air Force, uh, the kind of efforts, rates of efforts that we have generated there, we have flown about 1,500 hours in the Zamfara axis. Out of that, about 832 hours were dedicated to confirming our targets, to making sure that these people that we are attacking are indeed bandits. So you find a substantial percentage of the effort is towards confirming and making sure that the people you are attacking are the people that, did, that you know, deserve to be attacked. Apart from that, recently we established the Geospatial uh, Intelligence Data Center, which uses technology also to give us an idea of what is happening in the conflict zone. We also have ISR platforms that have cameras that can downstream whatever information they are getting on the battle space to the headquarters that is coordinating these operations, all in an effort to make sure that once we take the decision to attack, those guys are actually bad people who are out to kill innocent people. And so, but like I said, we'll wait for the results. Uh, we are not ruling out anything. we we'll wait, but we are confident that as a service, we do not tolerate uh, a situation where people that are innocent are killed. There are reports, of course, from that theater mm -hmm. that some of these bandits, some of these people uh, are actually firing back. Because earlier on, you, you spoke about 
the capacity, the disposition of the, the uh, enemy. The enemy. Mm. Uh, they're actually firing back at uh, air aircraft That's right. and trying to bring them down and, and so on. Uh, uh, that report was widely uh, spread. So in that kind of situation, would you still say that the rules that you talk about, because I mean, I'm sure there are rules for all out war, yeah. then there are rules for what are limited operations, uh, or started out as limited operations. But if some of these people are firing back, mm -hmm. uh, that speaks to probably the level of sophistication of arms that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, <clears throat> the Air Force will probably be expected to protect its own personnel. Certainly. So in that kind of situation, what, what, what's the plan? Well, in every operation, you have rules of engagement where the pilot is guided. So what exactly? For instance, I can give you so many uh, examples in the Northeast where we have gone out. We have intelligence, human intelligence, that says Boko Haram is located in so-so place, so-so number of vehicles. There are so many. And the aircraft gets there and then looks around and sees children and women around. And on several occasions, we have a register, as a matter of fact, in the Northeast, where those kind of missions that they were unable to execute because of the presence of children, women, and so on, the pilot turns around back with his, armament, with, with his ammo, come back, lands, and say, duty not carried out because this was the situation I saw. And in most cases, too, when we are conducting offensive operations, we have an ISR platform that is ahead over the fighter aircraft that is doing that. So it's capturing everything that is happening. And is able to verify. And is able to verify. Sometimes we do that for training. We look at it and say, no, you should have approached the target from this perspective. Why did you do it? We use that for training. We also use that sometimes when we have accusations, such as what is coming out from uh, the Northwest. We simply play it. Not only the Northwest, even in Newman, uh, people have accused the Air Force of, of, of bombing. But we have played the, the, the clip. We know that there was no such bombing. Uh, and we can always fall back on this video clip, like I said, to verify any claim, where it's very clear that something wrong has happened. Even before we are accused, we take necessary steps to deal with any infractions that we are able to uh, establish. So um, the kind of equipment the enemy uh, has determines what kind of ammo, what caliber of ammo we are going to use. Uh, yes, we have been fired, uh, but most times in the Northwest, what they use is the 7.6 mm rounds. They don't have a few occasions there were anti-aircraft guns and that fired on the aircraft, but luckily the pilot, I mean the aircraft was no hit, and he was still able to go there and ensure that those that are out kill him and kill other innocent villagers will not be there to, to carry out that their evil intention. Now, uh, I'm happy you, you, you uh, clarified that. that, which brings me to something you've mentioned two or three times now, mm -hmm. intelligence intelligence gathering. Yeah. Uh, a lot of those who have spoken about the general state of security have talked about the intelligence, intelligence gathering, human intelligence, and then of course uh, knowing what's going on mm -hmm. and then deciding what to do on that basis. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not flying blind. That is especially important for the Air Force. You've That's spoken right. about the efforts of the Air Force, but in working in, with other mm -hmm. For example, in the RAN incident, the Air Force was not alone, as mm -hmm. you pointed out. Yeah. That there were all, the other services were involved as well. Mm -hmm. Now, in working with other services in terms of human intelligence, what's the situation there? Because so many times people say that the three, the three main services of the armed forces are working separately. They are gathering their human intelligence separately. Some, they even have different agencies for intelligence gathering. Well, it is true we have uh, uh, intelligence agents, but this intelligence gathered is, is uh, there's what we call the intelligence fusion center, where all intelligence comes in there and is gathered, is analyzed, and uh, where, we, uh, where those analyzing the intelligence determine, ah, this information will be useful to the Air Force. Let's send it to them. And immediately the Air Task Force commander is contacted and he looks at the intelligence, he verifies it, and uh, takes the appropriate decision that he thinks. 
I don't want to, yeah, I have heard quite a number of times some people, but I, I think it's, it's, it's not a true reflection of the reality on ground, where people say the services are operating separately. It's not true. It's not true. There's no way you fight a war, you bomb a location where you have ground troops and you are not working together, you are not coordinating. It's impossible. By now, we would have killed so many of our own troops. But for the last 10 years or thereabouts, there has not been a single incident of the Air Force throwing bombs on its own troops. That clearly shows that there must be some level of coordination. The, the Army must, be able, I mean, must, must have been carried alone to understand, look, we are bombing, we are doing this. You see, there are two major areas uh, when it comes to employment of air power that we need to understand. There's what is called air interdiction. This is where you go deep into the enemy territory with the aim of damaging and destroying the assets of the enemy or the enemy before those assets are brought to bear on your friendly forces. Okay? But even at that, you really need to ensure that whatever you are doing fits into the overall plan of the commander of the operation. In those kind of operations, there might not be need for close coordination because you are going, the, the troops are far away from you. You are going right deep into the lecture, for instance. Okay? But whatever you are planning must fit into the overall plan of the commander. So which means there must be some kind of coordination. Then you have the second part of, 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 of uh, employment of air power. One of the roles is close air support. Close air support are operations that require very close coordination with the troops. Where you have the troops operating and the enemy is trying to interfere with what they're doing. So you are called from somewhere to knock off the enemy so that your ground troops can continue their operation. Of course, in such cases, there must be real, real, real coordination. Or else, rather than dropping the bomb in where the enemy is, you might end up dropping it on your own troops. So when people say uh, uh, there is no coordination and all that, I, it is funny. I see it as um, not a, I, I do not think it's a true reflection. Like I said, if there is no coordination with these operations, missions that I just spoke about, especially the close air operation, we go also for logistic resupply. We resupply the troops. Of course, we are going to coordinate. We have to talk to them that, look, we are bringing your spare parts for your tanks. We are bringing food, we are bringing water, we are bringing medication, or we are coming to evacuate a wounded man. There is no way you conduct this kind of operations without substantial coordination between the troops that are on ground. I, I think it's just a kind of misunderstanding, and sometimes some people are being mischievous. Now, uh, again, let me drill down on the issue of intelligence, because yeah. it seems to be at the heart of all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we talk about intelligence gathering. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there are certain things you cannot say publicly mm -hmm. about that, mm -hmm. compromising assets and all of that, but one needs to understand uh, how the thinking, as a service chief, mm -hmm. uh, what's, what, what's the thinking currently about intelligence gathering? How is that being done? Especially because you mentioned earlier in the interview mm -hmm. where you said, look, where you have <coughs> enemy combatants, mm -hmm. sprinkled amongst civilians, yeah. women and children and so on, you need to be able to separate them. Yeah. One of the ways to do that is intelligence gathering so that you are able to know, okay, at particular times they're here and so on. How is that going? Because again, if that is not in the big picture, yeah. as it were, and that some people have said is quite expensive yeah. to do, how is that going? You see, intelligence is very critical to every military operation. You must understand because for you to achieve what we are going out to achieve, you need information. Let me give you an example again. There were times that we had these uh, children, uh, girls coming with IEDs strapped to their bodies and exploding. How are you going to determine where these girls are coming from? How are you going to determine who is arming them? How are you going to determine who is recruiting them? There's no aircraft that can pick that information. 
and that is where human intelligence comes in. But then you also must understand that for human beings to really give you the intelligence that you require to protect them, you must find a way of engaging them. They must see in you that, look, you are there, these people are there to save us. You must find a way of engaging these people. For us in the Air Force, and I think substantially for most of the other services, we have tried realizing the fact that you cannot win a counterinsurgency operation without the support of the local population. The local population must key into what you are doing. They must understand that you are there for them and have the desire to give you what you require to really be able to deal with the situation on ground. And from 2015 to now, we have come up with what we call the non-kinetic uh, dimension of this, resolving these problems. And that is where you have the medical outreach program. We have treated over 300,000 uh, you know, people, uh, patients, IDPs mainly. We have even gone to the extent of opening our cancer screening centers in Maiduguri particularly for IDPs to have access. And the whole idea is to win their hearts and minds, to make them realize that we are not only fighting for you, but we are ready to support you. We are partners in progress. I mean, we are all going for the same objective. And the only way, like I said, you can do that is by bringing these people closer to you. And one way we thought we can do that, in order for them to really realize we are there for them, is through medical outreach not only in IDP camps, but even in their villages. Uh, we have on several occasions evacuated sick people from the villages in our helicopters, fly them into Maiduguri, our medical facility, treat them free of charge, and give them all the support, you know, medical support they require, and at the end of the day, fly them back to their villages. Now, over four years, these people have now realized that, look, these soldiers are not what these uh, terrorists are telling us. They even come to our villages. They treat us when we are sick. They even put us in something that they might not probably understand what it's all about because they have never been, uh, you know, they have, not, they have not flown before. So that clearly shows that human intelligence is very critical to what we're doing. And we have been utilizing whatever, source, whatever intelligence that comes to us to analyze it, see it, and use it for our operations. So uh, I want to use this opportunity to appreciate the people of the Northeast because they have been extremely supportive in, in, in coming to us, in coming to really understand that we are there for them. Not only the medical outreach, we also have, we have level two hospital in an IDP camp in Maiduguri, which was established in August 2015. From August till now, we have been providing medical services to, to these IDPs in, uh, in Dalori IDP uh, uh, camp in Maiduguri. Similarly, we have a level two hospital in Burma that also has wards, has laboratories, has everything, every basic facility. And where we think the situation requires evacuation, a helicopter comes in, lands there, pick the patient out, and that creates a sense of ownership in his mind that, look, this Air Force belongs to me. It's my Air Force. These are our people. So in that way, because we're engaging them that way, we're able to really uh, get a lot of uh, support and the information, and we are able to understand their thinking about some of these things. Uh, not too long ago, uh, I saw you at um, the opening of uh, a set of brand new barracks. Uh, um, I'm trying to recollect properly exactly where now. Yeah, in my degree, in my degree, degree one, exactly. Yes. When you were talking about your personal and the yeah. fact that when you bring them here, mm -hmm. this is a new place and yeah. so on, that they, after they've done the work, mm -hmm. they need to have a good place to rest their heads. That, that's right. Uh, I take that as a peg to look at the general issue of welfare. Mm -hmm. From time to time, those who are not in the military get to hear outside, you know, complaints about. Uh, uh, delayed allowances, uh, salaries, and so on. Uh, in the case of the Air Force, what's the situation? We have gone past the stage of making sure that people get allowances. That is too basic for us. 
there's nobody that is working anywhere that, has no, that does not get his allowance as at when due. But what we are looking at now is to go beyond that, make sure he has good accommodation, make sure his, his children can go to school, uh, medical facilities are there for the families. And recently, for the first time in the history of the Air Force, we have also extended a post-housing uh, program for other ranks. In the past, what we usually have is post-housing program for officers. But this time around, we have come in with this idea of having post-housing program for airmen. So that as you join the service, in 35 years down the line, you should be able to walk into a home that you can call yours. And we have started, uh, we are trying to see how we can get the infrastructure uh, required to make sure that the place is good and our airmen can key into that. So I think, uh, apart from that again, the uh, NAFOA, uh, Nigerian Air Force Officers Wives Association, have also taken the, the responsibility of skill acquisition programs. They have trained over 2,300 Barak boys and girls in Nigerian Air Force bases. They have given them the skills and they have given them startup pack. They have schools all over, in Patako, in Lagos and so on. And then officers and men of the service, officers particularly, and of course also men in the service contribute voluntarily every quarter to see how they can support these programs of NAFOA. And that has really impacted positively on uh, you know, the welfare of personnel generally, especially airmen. Uh, like I said, 2,300 guys, uh, barrack boys and girls, in the last uh, three and a half or four years is something that has substantially touched the hearts of our personnel. Now, um, uh, you've been uh, in defense communications. You've been in charge of standards and evaluation. Yes, yes, uh, yes. You've been in charge of training. And before your current appointment, you were chief of administration. So, That's right. Uh, you've been around. Uh, the Americans will say you've gone around the block and back. Um, Looking ahead now, the Nigerian Air Force, you alluded to it. This is its 55th year. Would you say that it has progressed in a manner in which is satisfactory to you as its chief today? <sighs> well, I think uh, one thing I can say for sure is that Nigerians, as Nigerians, we have every reason to celebrate the Nigerian Air Force. This was an Air Force that started in 1964, barely three years after uh, an act of parliament establishing the service came into being. The service was engaged in civil war with very few aircraft, DC-3. Uh, I met one of the first four pilots to be trained, uh, Air Commodore Dan Suleiman, and he was relating to me his experiences uh, where they fly the DC-3 and, 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 and they carry bombs, crude bombs, let's put it that way, uh, because they were just cylinders, uh, fire extinguisher cylinders, and they put things inside, and I also heard that from uh, late ABM, uh, Hamza Abdullahi. Now, this, this was the Air Force we had in 1964. But this same Air Force today can do so much, can project power, not only within Nigeria, but even outside Nigeria, despite enormous challenges of funding. Yeah, you remember in 2017, the Air Force, the Nigerian Air Force was in Gambia to support the ECOWAS mandate to ensure that uh, the political situation in Gambia is resolved in favor of what the people of Gambia want, wanted. We were there with C-130s. We were the only Air Force that went there with fighter aircraft. We mobilized all our troops, both the Army, the Navy, and no, not the Navy, Army Air Force. We used the C-130s, so many sorties to drop our troops there. We didn't require any support from anybody. Similarly, we are in Sierra Leone to support the Sierra Leonean people after the uh, mudslide, if I remember very well carried materials. Right now, as I speak to you, we are also working to support three other countries. So if you look at the history of the service from when it started in 1964 to now, in 1964, we had only virtually a single command. Today, we have six commands. 
Of course, the challenges of 64 are now are different. But the fact still remains that uh, we have made substantial progress from an air force that was rolling bombs from cabin to throw out, uh, you know. Today we have younger officers in their 20s, you know, controlling from ground control uh, centers, controlling UAV, sophisticated equipment, and dropping uh, the same bombs 250 miles away from where they are controlling the UAV. That clearly shows that we have made substantial progress. And today we are hoping in the next few months we are going to get the first fighter, female, female fighter pilot in the Air Force. She is doing extremely well. Similarly, we are going to get the first female helicopter gunship pilot. So I think we have every reason to celebrate our service. Um, there were a lot of difficulties, especially during the, the, the military era where they were, funding was a, a very serious issue. But I think since the advent of democracy in 1999, we have seen substantial progress, and particularly in the last four years. I just read the number of platforms. By the end of 2021 or thereabout, would have inducted 44 brand new aircraft into the service. This is huge. Are we there? No, we are not. We, we still have challenges, and that's where the issue of funding comes in. For a country of our size and our population, I think we need to look at the funding issue again critically and see how we can have um, the platforms that we require to be much more effective than we are today. Uh, as the final and throwaway question, um, I've been hearing this for quite a while, and I said, when I have the opportunity, I'm going to ask a serving Air Force chief this. Right. Um, because I have quite a number of friends who are in the Air Force. Is it true that for you to be the head of the Air Force, you've got to be a pilot? It's not only Nigerian Air Force, the whole world, globally. For you to head the Air Force, you must be a pilot. That is the global tradition. It's not a Nigerian tradition. <laughs> <laughs> Marshal Abubakar, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you for this. coming. We've come to the end of this episode of Newsnight. Do make our time to join us for another edition next week. I am Ladi Akiri Doluale.